Hello guys and welcome back to another episode of No Tuts Allowed. And remember, that's a misnomer. We just talk about Linux without having to talk about Linux. And today with me is Josh. Uh, this is in fact Josh and uh, we are definitely talking about Linux today. And Big Bob. <laughs> Hi. So Steve. <clears throat> yes, sir. I know that you at one point was a distro maintainer or a respinner or whatever people want to call them, but I have a dream, and, and I want to see if, see if I can get you to agree with this dream here. All right? Okay. I would. I have this dream of a Linux distribution where things actually worked, and uh, when they worked, they worked as they were advertised. Like okay. say, if I if I load up Firefox, I can watch any video on the internet that I want. I don't have to deal with DRM issues. They, things just work. Hardware acceleration works perfectly fine. <coughs> or say if I fire up a MP3 file, my my uh, audio player can play it perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. I can load a Blu-ray disc into an optical drive, which I know is a thing of the past. But, you know, I can drop it, I can drop it in the tray, hit the close button, and whatever media content that's on that disc just plays back with that, no issue. And, uh, you know, like even say, cause you know, I, I'm a small content creator as well. I fire up OBS studio and all the features of OBS studio work as advertised. And I would ideally on these applications specifically not have to rely on a containerized sandbox for these applications, even though it is kind of a good idea, but I don't feel like those kind of applications should be packaged up as that and ideally for this distribution i would like it to be upstream like not right up there at the bleeding edge like say an arch linux but you know just a step behind or so I am i insane in this yes <laughs> <sighs> you're living on cloud number nine yeah uh, okay okay uh and Big Pod, of course, uh, I, I know that this immutable image based thing is fantastic and amazing. But, you know, I don't want to have to deal with that because I want to be able to go into slash Etsy and, and tinker with stuff or uh, be able be able to go into slash bin and just randomly delete a binary. You shouldn't be able to do that at all. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because slash bin is actually a, a, a sim link in most cases to slash user bin. Which Correct. users shouldn't be able to touch. Slash but what if user. I want to? Well, if you want to, you're insane. I mean, I already knew that. I mean, uh, has nobody ever looked at my channel before? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. Okay, I'm, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit less flippant about it. You are one percent of one percent. Simple as that. At that point, so I'm 0 .1%. of computer users, yes, actually okay. point zero one percent of well, computer users. Then, well, here's the thing. If I may, since I am an Arch user, and what Josh just uh, did right there, he fires so many shots at Arch and flat packs. <laughs> I uh, I might be uh, crawling right now, but I'm not. Why? Because to a certain degree, I do agree with him because, it, okay, it is a dream and Shocker. we all can dream and we're allowed to dream, but flat packs, yes, they do have their caveats, but that's not a distro related thing. That's its own separate thing. It's not the distro packaging that, but where I disagree is it's a it would be, it should be a dream to have flat pack and no distro specific package manager. That way, we're not dealing with every distro's uh, opinionated package manager. Instead, we are, uh, we use only a single package manager that, that is easy to install. My dream distro, you just, you just made me have to talk about my dream distro. You had to poke the bear. My dream distro is as follows. Arch, 
with flatback and stable KDE. Done. <laughs> we know that this will not happen because Arch is a rolling distro and uh, KDE is a kind of a tinker and enjoy kind of desktop environment. But this is my deem a dream distro. But there is another aspect to a dream distro that not a lot of people talk about, and it is how to install said distro. We need a standard way to install all distros that not need. Sorry, I take that back. My dream distro would be a, a distro that uses a, a better way to install the distro. So something that's better than Calamari's. Better than Calamari's, better than Arch install, better than everything that currently exists. I give you Bootsy, but that's still not yet at the level that would be usable. That's still a little young, isn't it? <laughs> Very young and still doesn't work much, but hopefully one day. One day, but since we're talking about our dream distros that is my dream distro i want to i'm sticking to kde i'm sticking to arch until i croak should i say shall yeah, i say and, and you touched on another aspect when you mentioned uh d having to having to uh deal with the division of flat pack and distro package manager it would be nice to see like a single package manager that <laughs> handles all of the formats yeah so native packages flat packs snaps even app images to some extent but I would, and I know that such things exist. Yes. But they all feel like disjointed, hacks. disjointed hacks. and hacks. Yeah. 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 Because they, by well, definition, what, are hacks. They yeah, are hacks. Yeah. They are all hacks. And you know, if if I can get something that seems like a smooth experience that works very, very well and almost flawlessly, I would really appreciate that. That's exactly what I meant. But when yeah. I said flat, uh, flat back to distribute everything, because I want to distribute the kernel via flatback terminal uh tweaks or terminal based apps via flat flatback everything via flatback i didn't i don't want a uh oh your distro ships with its own package manager but you can also use flatback on the side or you can use app images or you can use no i want a single package manager that does everything that is a dream Within a dream, within a dream, within a dream, within a dream, go Inception style. On other hand, I, my dream of a dream distra is one that would be, comp would <clears throat> base image would be as small as possible. It would be completely immutable. It would be essentially a, a OCI image, so a Docker image, no OS3, no, no, no oh no stuff like that. okay okay no i thought we were OS3. talking about silver blue here for a second actually no <laughs> there, there is a there is a level beyond that where you can actually deploy a container or container image that's a future upon future but mm -hmm. what i really want the container. base image would be completely like completely bare there would be no user user utilities at all it's it is there just to be there so you can boot into it and all that Everything happens. Everything should be done overlaid on top of it. Where it, that'd be basic slash Etsy would be not editable on the on the base image side. But then since it would be overlaid on top of it, you could do whatever you want with it. Same with slash user. Same with your home directory. Everything would be built on top of that base image. That means your base. You wouldn't need an installer. You'd install once and you're done. And then all you need to do was, if you want a new desktop environment, you would select it from from a from a menu, and it would have. After a reboot, you would have KDE. You would have no whatever you wanted. That would be that would be the best, and everything would be an overlay on top of your your base system. So an application, if you want a, a flat pack, you could have it. You could, if you want to have a native package, although that's a that's a very, that's an oxymoron if, if mm -hmm. you compare it with Flatpak, because Flatpak is technically more more native than a native package. It, it depends on who you ask. It depends on how how you use kernel technologies. That too. And when you look at that, all that could be just an overlay on top of a very clear, very 
bare basic image. That's the that's the perfect system, perfect Linux based system, if you ask me. But that future is far away and everything could be like an overlay. That, that future is far away and honestly m will likely only exist in server space and by nerds like me. No, uh, server space, they don't mess with desktop environments and they don't want yeah, to. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's mm, the built on I, top of. That's, that's the thing I you have build seen, on top of what I server have space seen will do. Desktop. I have seen like full GNOME stacks running yes. on on production servers. I've seen that as well. So. I've seen, I've seen full full Windows desktop environments. I've seen I've seen GNOME. I've seen yeah. all sorts of things. And what I've I'm seen Windows managers working. But what I was trying to say is the part of that dream will will probably in ten to fifteen years exist on servers. Then it will be up to people like me to build it from that for desktop. Well, you you touched on something very interesting there, Big Pod. Um, the fact that we can... That would be a nice dream to dream, uh, that desktop environments are just a click away. That is a really nice dream. But to make it more perfect, it would be, I selected KDE, get rid of GNOME, replace it with KDE. Yeah, that, that, Not, that, that, that would... If it's yeah. an overlay, I wonder it has no effect on the rest of the system except on the, the that couple of settings that live in your home directory. So you're thinking, stay. so you're thinking so, uh, like DistroBox, but more more uh, GUI based. Yes. Uh, so I have maybe this you crazy can check idea. out there is a system D project for exactly that. I can't remember the top of my head. I I can tell you. When I remember, there is a there uh, is a thing for that as well, and that should be what we're looking for. I think we can actually do something like that with next big pod. Uh, not really. I mean, yeah, we can have like a base NextOS image that just boots into a CLI environment, and then just apply flakes on top of that, uh. which yeah. could theoretically work. And then be able to just like do a clean boot for a uh, switch from a uh, gnome to KDE. Because I've I I have toyed around with Nixos a little bit, and uh, you, there's even a distro hacking episode where uh, I think it was the very first distro hacking episode where I de where I tinkered around with Nix, and I could completely switch from KDE to gnome to XFCE very cleanly. But using, yeah, but I can using I the can generations silver blue as well. Yeah, I can do it with silver blue as well. Yeah, and it can be done using generations on Nix. Just yeah. install that, go to a generation, go back a generation, I mean, that... forward a generation. Parts of forward. parts of that are already already a thing. But what I was alluding to was something called System D system extensions. Of course, in my in my perfect world, System D would be just an init system. It wouldn't be so sprawling as it is today, but yeah, better oh, have it as a system D extension I, than nothing at all. I forgot to mention one very important thing about my dream distro. Go ahead. And that is a stable, once and for all, once and done version of Grub. In my perfect world, Grub wouldn't exist anymore. Well, that's all, why we're different. All would be handled by by your UFI because that's oh, that, yeah. that's all you need. Really. Yeah, I I well, I agree. Re remove I agree that operating system between the UFI and Linux. Yeah, if you if you say UFI, then yeah, we don't need a bootloader. Let's UFI take care of things and call it a day, like uh, Windows, like. Windows does basically. Technically, Windows also has a boot man bootloader, but it is yeah. really, really, really tiny. Problem with Grub is it's not really, really, really tiny. I mean, the Windows bootloader only has to worry about one operating system. Technically, no. Technically, you can boot as many versions of Windows as you want from that thing. Yeah, but every single every every single Windows bootloader is ever going to look for the Windows NT kernel. Yeah, just one kernel. It, yes. it just says a hard call for Windows NT. 
<laughs> and yeah, as soon as it finds it, it will present you a list of Windows NT kernels, of which is every single copy of Windows post Windows 2000. Yeah. But, so, but on it only hand, cares about one kernel. But on the other hand, <laughs> Windows Windows Boot Manager is actually pre, uh, actually better than anything Linux has to offer. I'm yep. gonna tell you why, because it has it works. Most, it might works <laughs> always. And two, it has all the recovery utilities you need. Yeah. Because it has another true. operating system. Well, separately. it has had longer than Linux to, to grow. <laughs> Le- uh, Linux has no recovery utilities that are built into the distro if you need to boot outside of it, uh, unless you call that that uh, that maintenance uh, e- emergency mode. Oh, system emergency mode? Yeah. Uh, it's close. It's sort of close but there Not... is no factory reset that's yeah, what we no need factory reset we yeah. need we need a way to factory well, reset our operating system and that's exactly what that would bring what i was I saying i think pop os is, has has something like that actually if i yeah i think so basically they have another another version of a uh, tiny pop os if I, if I remember correctly yeah, and uh pop os is using system debut if i remember right i don't think it's using Grub. so yes and I just remembered, uh, since you mentioned Pop! OS, uh, testing versions of uh, Cosmic Desktop were being were being uh, released, or say that basically the rec- recommended way to test them was with Systemd system extensions. The technology, I am saying, is one of the ways we can achieve my perfect distro. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to be clear. I, I'm, I, I'm not one who has messed with bootloaders, even Grub. All I did with on, on Zero Linux was include a theme to, <laughs> to make it look good. But beyond that, I don't know how to use Grub recovery. I don't know how to mess around with bootloaders. That's why I, I don't, don't like either. to change. I don't like to change because I know Grub works for me. Uh, but in a perfect world, I want, like BigPod said, I would hope that a bootloader or no bootloaders are used or if a bootloader needs to be used for linux one that it's doesn't need to that is transparent that doesn't need to show itself it just yeah. boots not like uh, the the silent flag we have for grub where we hide it completely set it to zero and and hide it it's still grub running in the background no we need something and plus we need a factory reset because currently linux uh, every time somebody uh, encounters a problem that destroys their system, the only choice they have is to wipe and reinstall yeah. fresh. Why reinstall if you can have a factory reset? Exactly, and it would be it can be a small, tiny image that's yeah. uh, saved in your BIOS or whatever, in your CMOS or whatever, and then you can call it back and call it a day. I have a version of uh, of a tiny Linux distro. Running, uh, running a factory reset, actually working on some VM, but I never been able to translate it into anything besides a very carefully crafted environment, because it, because of how installations currently work. You know what we're doing here, guys? Maybe we're inspiring the the Linux people right there. Maybe they get Hopefully. inspired by this episode. I, I oh, am funny. curious if uh, some somebody is willing to give us some feedback on like uh, this discussion and see if like maybe we can progress or if there's already such a project that's where its goal is to actually obtain something like that because yeah. that actually is a really interesting concept, Big Pod. It is really interesting, uh, and to be honest, I didn't even though I said even my dream distro is Arch. But in, uh, let's let's be honest. Uh, in a real world, it's never gonna be Arch. I mean, but in a real it, world, nobody would use Arch. Exactly. <laughs> so, for me, it would be something on the Debian realm. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a truly independent distro. Yeah, but come on, based on Debian, it would be more stable. <laughs> if you ask me, the base should be very stable. But then what you yeah. put on top of that base, what you overlay on the top of that base can be as unstable as you want it to be. It's exactly like but, the, the uh, argument the, I... Uh, the point is that base, the base itself, the, the thing that holds yeah. holds everything else online, that holds everything else up, should be 
should be very 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 stable everything else what you do doesn't really matter and yeah, if, so... it, if it goes goes uh, boom well you have a factory reset there press so theoretically theoretically all we would realistically need is a bootloader a kernel and systemd and very basic set of packages so you can and a subset run of packages for like system D but what what so basically like whatever what? requires pid 1 and, to fire and, up. and something to update every so often that base base system yeah, as a whole uh, timer d it's already in system d i mean the utility that would update that that yeah. uh, that base transparently to the user okay every but... every i don't know month or something so it 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 fixes let's say bugs in system d or holes security holes or in a driver d or two and, dr and updates drivers and stuff like that yeah and I guess we all three, I hope we all three agree on this. The desktop environment should be something along the lines of GNOME. Not GNOME itself, but something like GNOME, stable, easy to use, gets so, out of your way. Something that, that, that goes GNOME by the or principles a pre of GNOME, plasma. but isn't GNOME. Tries to yeah. be as perfect as possible, but actually moves a bit faster than GNOME. Yes. So maybe co stage. maybe Cosmic because it sounds like that they're doing a lot of cool stuff with Cosmic. Possibly. Yeah. We uh, we still uh, we still need to wait and see because yeah. uh, the way I see Cosmic headed is more along the lines of GNOME with a little bit of uh, with a dash of plasma. <laughs> I see K uh, Cosmic as a good distro, but I'm not. I, honestly, I'm not 100% uh, sure Sys System76 are going to be the best custodians for it. Well, yeah, we'll they're creating out. it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll find out. And I hope that, uh, you know, it's it doesn't get just limited to just Pop! OS. I, I would like to be able to... No, see it's Cosmic not limited to Pop! No, OS. Uh, Fedora will have a version at least for the... At least for the uh, atomic version, I know, I know there there is someone working on it, and I know oh, I believe there is. I, also I heard that there was a discussion. Team. I didn't know that there was actually somebody working on it. So there I... is somebody working on yeah. in the background, as far as I remember. And there's a maintainer on Arch also. Yeah. Okay, because you know I I actually am curious to to uh, take at least take a look at the Cosmic Desktop because you know if I'm going to be running a a desktop environment, I've been using Window Managers long enough that I really appreciate that I can have. More, uh, independent workspaces on each monitor. Oh yeah, they're gonna have that. They're gonna yeah, have that. And uh, that's something that they, that that they said that they were gonna have, and they said that they were still gonna be able to support like a dynamic tiling system. And hopefully, it's not nearly as jank as the one that's currently in Pop OS today, because mm, yeah. I don't like their tiling logic. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, as soon as it lands for Arch, I'm gonna be testing it. I'm gonna be testing the heck out of it. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you something. As soon as it lands first release, they're gonna be gonna be a flood of YouTube videos about Cosmic. Uh, I, I mean, there's definitely gonna be a flood of YouTube videos as soon as the first, probably as soon as like the first beta drops. There's gonna be yeah. a flood of YouTube videos. But here, here's uh, here's what I said on on my live stream. I I swore an oath in front of everyone that was watching that I will not be doing DE or distro reviews. So. Uh, but, uh, that's fine because they're incredibly boring to make. Yeah, boring to make. <laughs> not 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 about boring to make. It they they take a lot of work. If you want to do it right, you have to use it for weeks before you, a distro or a desktop environment. You have to use either though either of those for weeks before you have uh, constructive criticism to talk about or uh, to talk about it in yeah. general. So, uh, I'm. Uh, but when it comes. To, to Cosmic to me what Cosmic looks like right now is kind of my my dream desktop environment we're gonna see yeah Let's so uh, I'm, if it, if it lives up to, for it to if it lives up to, to our see. dreams I guess we'll actually have to work on the dream distro but uh, in the meantime I heard that Germany that that this German state also has their own dream uh, have you have have you heard about this, Steve? Yes, I have. Uh, it they're moving their uh, people to Linux and LibreOffice. Yeah, uh, that is I interesting. 
I don't know my German too well. Uh, so I think it's a German state called Schleswig Holstein. I'm Holstein. maybe. Holstein. Is that a good German impression? No, Big it's Pod? Holstein. They See? say Holstein. 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 Let, Holstein. let me find it and I can Holstein. tell you. Holstein. Uh, they say Holstein. But... Yeah. Is it... I think it's Schleswig Holstein. Okay. Uh, but again, that, 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 that's, the, that's the first German I read in probably a year. So. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, obviously uh, we're not German. Uh, but anyways, uh, they're, they're switching the... They're, they're, they have decided that they are forsaking the broken windows. And they would like to embrace the tux. Uh, as to which tux they're embracing, I don't know which one yet. But we at least the know there's... The choice for them would probably be open. So since it's, it's German... Japanese yeah, and uh, Sousa, the company, is probably like next door to them. Yeah, it's a German yeah, company. Yeah, uh, that that would make sense. But we do know that they are switching to LibreOffice. Yeah. Uh, like the Open Document Foundation came out and set, said that they were switching to LibreOffice. But that's yeah. a... Uh, that... And... Okay. Uh, I might take a couple of minutes here to, to, to say what I have to say because that's an opinion that I'm, that scares me because that's something that scares me. If more and more states worldwide start adopting Linux like that, to me, it, it, it's like draw... So, uh, Al, uh, somebody, uh, Alex... Uh, pointed out that although this might happen uh, it, since Linux is uh, uh, is open source things get patched and fixed much quicker than on Windows or, or proprietary operating systems theoretically but, theoretically but, very theoretically yeah that's what I said uh, but it's like drawing a big bullseye on Linux's back because bigger adoption, and bigger, uh, more attackers want to attack. In my opinion, that's a good thing. I would like to push back on that, Steve. Because what? what runs 90% of the internet? Yeah, Linux. Linux. I get it. So a how much does more, Linux much not... more high-value targets, let's be honest. Yeah, how, how, does, how does Linux not already have a target on its back? Yeah. Well, th what I meant was in the Linux desktop and user world, not... Server. Most because vulnerabilities so in, the, in the server you're world are going to be server server based. Yeah, but Even server then, because they're most easiest to exploit and have I mean, much bigger target target they're, field. They're yeah, still, but they're still but, connecting over SSH on on some things. They might still be connecting over HTTP to some things. These are things that servers typically do. Yeah, yeah. and of course they're probably using di a distro that that runs Open SSH or that runs SSHD. Yeah, so, but company, uh, but companies and and stuff like that, they have mitigations in place to circumvent such yes, issues. Yes, but in the but desktop the world, day, we don't have mitigations. Not mm, all of us have. Technically, uh, we do. I mean, yeah. Ubuntu ships Ubuntu literally ships Dejadoop by default in their in their images. It's called uh, backups. And it's already time that, that we start shipping firewall on all these trusts. Yeah, uh, Fedora ships with a firewall enabled. Thankfully. Ubuntu does ship with a firewall, but it's disabled by default. Yeah. Uh, and I don't install a firewall. But what I wanted to point out is that it isn't the, the computer systems or the operating systems that are, that are the threat or that are likely target as a threat. You are user. Yeah. Social engineering is a much, much easier to do than, than hack a computer. True, but... Us as end users, hello. We think I'm your friend. <laughs> uh, we th we tinker a lot with our, with our computers, so uh, we might render our computers uh, susceptible to, to to a lot of attacks because of our constant yeah. tinkering and uh, and stuff like that. So, uh, but if if companies, I think if if big companies like that adopt Linux, they might have their own mitigations against attack. But at the same time, they, uh, there is more chance that we're going to have more contributors and more importantly, contributions. And yeah. that, that doesn't just mean 
people contributing code it means people contributing documentation and people contributing money because money opens all the doors and and solves problems because and been, when people I've will been... have time to work on whatever needs to happen not whatever they like to to work on and I've been looking into something recently uh, to a comment I made on my live stream to see if it was uh, true or not or it, or if it held any water and it did uh, to get uh, such mitigations in place and to get Linux to 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 be adopted without having uh, having to worry about anything we need uh, to be as users we need to be more uh, careful what uh, what we install and we need to contribute uh, at yeah. least issues report issues upstream the right way so we, that's... we need more contributions of all mm. types but... That's what I'm doing in my spare time. Uh, now, I don't maintain anything except my script, which doesn't take time at all. It takes five minutes once a week. But uh, now I'm, what I'm doing is I'm reporting bugs upstream more and more and more and more because I want to be part, uh, part of the uh, change, part of the fix, part of bettering Linux, not part of the problem. Yeah. Well... Uh, just just remind everybody out there when you when you're running a when you find you install an application on a Linux desktop and you find out the application is not working, don't go to the application developer first. Go go to the, the maintainer of the package that you installed first. Yeah, the distributor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> well, and and I'm gonna just jump back to to the topic at hand because it actually does. Uh, that's a bit of this uh, what we talk about now. Now, uh, we should remember that Germany already was using Linux. Yeah, certain states, certain municipalities uh, Munich, were using Munich uh, did the switch. I think they. Yeah. I think they switched. I think they switched back to Windows, but they. Yes. But they. They still have some workstations that still use uh, yeah. Linux. And they, they were uh, using Linux for quite quite a bit of time. So yeah, clearly there wasn't there wasn't. A huge now, jump in hackings, just because now, uh, German Munich, German municipalities had Linux. Yeah, and Munich had its own issues. Like they did this yeah. the wrong way. Uh, yeah, they, didn't they, they use made their own distro. Yeah, they they literally made their own distro. I don't think it was a downstream fork of anything. So they were. I believe literally... it was, but it was so custom that it was unmaintainable or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, it, it just wasn't maintainable, and uh. The, there was no like actual training for like employees, and I think yeah. the main reason why they switched away was because uh, a legislator attempted to send an email in Thunderbird and enables some encryption, and they couldn't find the button for it. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember right, uh, this was years ago that I read this, so I might yeah, be wrong. I, I think it was right around <laughs> the time that I started using Linux that the switch back happened. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, ho hopefully, this state can use Munich as an example of how not to switch to Linux. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 when you, when you said they couldn't find the button, the only thing that came to my head was that's so spaceballs of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh right. boy. Uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, that makes me happy to to see more and more. Uh, States and higher ups moving to Linux. This this me being scared. It's just me being scared for for desktop users because we uh, I see more and more uh, distros uh, that come out. Not the ma the majority of distros don't don't come out with security first. They come with a skin first or a rice yeah. first or some little kernel tweaks to make gaming better or to ga to make watching YouTube better, but not security specific. That's the only reason uh, I, I worry. Not because uh, we're doing something wrong. It's just... Okay, so last week I touched on this XZ uh, vulnerability or XZ, depending on what world of English dialect you decide to live in. I, I live in America. 
Yeah, it's 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 Z, not Z. Uh, anyways, uh, so uh, first of all, relevant XKCD uh, two three four seven. I'm sure that you've seen that one many times over the past few years, but it still applies to to uh, the same argument today. But anyways, uh, I'm gonna talk in like a sense of a timeline, right? Uh, and the original XZ uh, maintainer, I don't know his name. Uh, he was Chai Ten. No, Jake. that's the the coal maintainer. Oh, that's uh, that would be the last Colin. Yeah, it, it, it's it's. It's I'm talking about like the original original XZ maintainer. Yeah, uh, the last Colin, or something. Yeah, like that. that one. And uh, he was working very tirelessly on XZ, and he put out a call for help. And the and thank the, you. Yeah, you got to yeah. say that. Thank, and thank to every you other for every other contributor whoever worked on open source. Yeah, uh, thank you specifically for not only maintaining XZ up until you decided that you were going to turn the project over, but even especially putting out the call for help and. And uh, thank you for all the people that came to help. Unfortunately, an, a certain individual came to help a lot, and he did very good work. Yeah. And he did work so good that this guy handed the project over to him. And he continued the work on maintaining XZ, and he built up a two-year repertoire of doing a good job with managing XZ utils and XZ yeah. compression in general. Now, at some point, he, uh, he decided that he was going to start injecting malicious code, not into the source code, but into the released tarballs of XZ. Yeah, basically, from what I understand, it was a two-stage system. Basically, part of the code, part of the vulnerability was in the testing, testing uh, blobs, and part of the vulnerability, the, the activator, was in the tarballs. So when you got the test, testing onto your build system and you started building the tarball building from the tarball it hooked into the, the one of the tests pulled down relevant bits out of the test and then build them into actual vulnerability yeah and uh that's how this got introduced now in in the way that it, that uh, this this malicious code executes is the one of the very first steps that it actually takes is it takes a hard step it takes a hard step to figure out how it was installed. Was it installed and it checks for two things. Was it installed as a deb or was it installed as an RPM? If it's neither, it fails. That is interesting. Now, what that means is that uh, this is a very specifically targeted attack. Clearly targeted at, attack, yeah. At RPM-based distributions such as OpenSUSE and Fedora and its downstream partners of Red Hat or Debian. And or it's downstream Ubuntu. partner of Ubuntu. Yeah. So that so this is where the theory of state actor begins to come in, and I'm not going to go further down that rabbit hole. But what that basically means is that if you're on any other distribution platform like Gen2, Arch Linux, or anything like that, you're fine. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you should be fine. Now, but at least up to what we know. Oh, there could be hidden traps still there. Yeah. Now, I do have a link in, in the show notes or the description on YouTube uh, that's listed below to a Flashpoint article. I actually have not read that article, but I know the Flashpoint, when they do a write-up on a vulnerability like this, they typically do a very good job. So I'm kind of just like blindly throwing that in there, and I'll probably read it after we record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyways, uh, so I want to roll back this conversation to the very first person I spoke about, the original maintainer of, of XZ. The reason why he turned the project over was he just didn't feel like working on it anymore. Burnout. Yeah, and a very huge problem for uh, it, it was burnout. Developers. And, and of course, uh, the reason why I'm citing XKCD2347 is because it literally says modern digital infrastructure of this huge, massive conglomerate and then at the Somewhere at the bottom of what we call the software supply chain, there's a project that's used very widely, maintained by a random person that's been thanklessly maintaining it since 2003. Yeah, and the other the the, uh, the other reason is that he initially developed that project as a hobby. As a hobby. Yeah. Yeah. It, it now here is my issue with everybody's response. 
everybody's response has been, yes, we should pay the maintainer. That's actually the correct one. The yep. wrong one is the maintainer needs needs to uh, the maintainer of the project needs to be in, injecting all of these checks into it to verify that you know his tarballs are being built right and not maliciously, yep. you know like uh, tar tarball scanning and signature verifying and all and this uh, this this thing this thing this thing this thing this thing I think there's like a there's like a pro, there's like a company now that has a tool that says that yep. hey if you give us a tarball we'll scan it for you. Yeah, the dog now. Not. This, My opinion is now, somewhere in between. We all of those responses. Them, but well, we hang, also on, put hang on, just a second. Checks, hang on, just checks. a second. Hang on, just a second. The checks are a good solution, yes, but there's only one maintainer of the project, and that's the guy that injected all the malicious code. Yeah. Is he going? And you know, if he ran it through those scanners and he says, "Oh yeah, that, that's fine," he'll publish it anyway. And here comes the part that I am missing from the equation that nobody talks about. And this alludes back to episode one, when we talked about uh, fragmentation, where, it, where we talked about it, that projects, especially big projects, should be part of groups of projects, which means multiple maintainers of other projects. And here comes then the code reviews. I bet code reviews could have caught at least part of this. Code yes. reviews could have caught it if, you know, uh, the XZ project had more than one maintainer. Had more than one maintainer, yes. Yeah. But see, but then we should remember that there are some maintainers who only do code reviews. That's true. And that could be a nice outlet for people who are who may suffer first stages of burnout to to change their role from writing code to check it over code. It does yeah, but... manage their burnout, but at the end of the day, that in this case wouldn't matter because it was maintained by one maintainer, which means that maintainer had full control over whatever he wanted to do or they wanted to do. And here's, uh, I don't know if I'm correct, stop me if I'm wrong, but one of the problems is that all these companies that uh, used his code or his project uh, and made it a hard dependency and started demanding more and more and more and more from him without without offering him a position or anything just relying him uh, on him as a contributor uh, I think that's what contributed to his burnout because yeah, I mean that's exactly how it works yeah, yeah. He got burnt out as a single maintainer. One, and that is, that applies to me because I was alone, single maintainer, maintaining a distro that over a hundred thousand people were using. And I didn't want to reach the same point as this developer because I was maintaining a whole entire distro, and I was maintaining over five hundred packages from the AUR. I was controlling when to ship uh, new versions that come out on the AUR because some versions would be broken, others not, and all this. So I didn't want to suffer a burnout, so I called it quits at the right time. But for him, <coughs> it's not an option because so many projects rely on his little thing. Yeah. And on that point, uh, do, do you to use any software that relied on Exe? Well, on... uh, I don't believe I'm using anything directly. I I think uh, Gentoo is using LZMA for uh, their pack for their package compression. Isn't that related? Yes. <laughs> uh, LibLZMA is. It, Lib it LZMA, might be. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'd have to dig into that a little bit, but uh, on I Arch, don't... I don't think there is. Anything, I believe Arch... doesn't Arch ISO use uh, XZ compression? No, ZSTD. But uh, I know the Pac-Man packages are ZSTD. Uh, no, they don't use XZ because when I used to build the ISO, it wasn't using XZ. XZ was the extremely slow. They switched. Okay. They switched from XZ to ZSTD. I think a year ago or a year and a half ago. And now they uh, they don't 
do anything but they do have SSA, uh, sshd but since we what you mentioned earlier in the episode arch is not targeted because it's not rpm it's not yeah. debian uh what blows my mind is that they're building in like uh is that the uh, distro maintainers are adding additional features into uh xz so that it talks to uh oh yeah system actually that ID. happens to uh, uh, the yeah. reason why this happened was because they adding a feature to SS, sshd that wasn't there for systemd notifiers yeah yeah which which kind of makes i think sense. even the open ssh product but doesn't not want really. to do that <laughs> <laughs> as far as but, I heard, now now there is a full feature for oh, oh, system D notifiers in the SSHD upstream. Of course. <laughs> and on the topic of XZ, I actually did use XZ not, not that long ago for my standard, standard compression. Now I switched, probably a couple of months now I switched to uh, Z standard because... It's by Facebook, and I, and I have somebody to blame. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, my, rather than an email that, that, that's my that's my standard <laughs> standard uh, why I use a specific piece of software. It's most likely because it's made by a company and it's open source, so I can blame the company that something didn't work. Not 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 some random maintainer who I don't know, who I don't, uh, whose intentions I really don't know. And at the end of the day, they they don't have reputation that can actually be hurt. So basically what happened with XZ, to close it out, uh, what what happened with XZ should uh, bring up in us more awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we just need to support our maintainers, like, yep. actually. Yeah. I do support three maintainers. There are three maintainers that I do support wholeheartedly, and uh, one of them being Chris Titus Tech. Uh, because he's doing great work, even though it's not Linux related, it's more Windows related, but he's contributing his knowledge to better, uh, to make open source more prevalent in on Windows. So he, he's got the right, his heart is in the right place. And two other maintainers who are maintaining be- wonderful packages on, who have created wonderful packages on, I... specifically for Arch. <laughs> I I support maintainers, but I still see, and I need to be better at it to support the the transient maintainer, the people who ma- who maintain the dependencies, that the oh, frontline packages actually do do uh, use. So we all we all here probably in one way or another want to su- either support or want to support OBS Studio, but how many of us? support ffmpeg how any of us support other dependencies for obs studio and and other projects like firefox yeah, uh, and libraries used by firefox and any other pr- program we use yeah 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 I mean, like that, i uh, one of point. one of one of the people i support does work on a on something for obs uh, it's called pipewire app per app Pipewire audio or app, Pipewire app audio, whatever, where you can, where you capture per app audio. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So it's, uh, we need to support the maintainers and the transient maintainers. We need to show support because a lot of them are alone. They, they do the work alone because here's the thing. When you maintain the code alone, like BigPod said, you have more control. When you when you have more people working on it, you never know what's going to happen down the chain. Yeah. If you if you maintain all of the dependencies yourself, it's easy to control the whole situation. Problem is most packages don't don't have zero dependencies. No. At the end of the day, your language is one dependency. Yeah. The language you use what if what if uh, a vulnerability got into I don't know JavaScript based based libraries I mean, or C based libraries or in my case C sharp based libraries? What would then happen? Yeah, yeah. E- e- even even your Go binary requires at least Go to run. Yes. Yep, and Rust same and, thing with Rust. And even even Rust, which which can be which is statically compiled, so it doesn't require any kind of binary. 
other binary than itself to run requires a binary to build itself. So yep. that could be injecting vulnerabilities into your code. Yep. Yeah. Yep. At the end of the day, support your maintainers. Yep. <laughs> and speaking of which, uh, Flatpak did something new. Uh, Flathub, sorry, did something new. Here I go. I made the mistake. Uh, <laughs> Flathub did something new. I don't know how useful it is because I love flat packs. Not right now. Now I have a hate relationship with flat, flat packs <laughs> from Flathub. Uh, but uh, Flathub did something interesting, but yet useless. I agree with whoever made the video. Uh, I think Brody made the video. But uh, they, they added a new... Uh, tag, a new, yeah, a new flag that can a new be flag. To basically everything that doesn't have a verified check mark. <laughs> so why do that? Anything, if something has a check mark, like Brody said, if something has a check mark and something doesn't, so naturally the thing that doesn't have a check mark means it's unverified. So why mm. add the verified? <laughs> unverified. I actually think that explicit, explicit notice of unverified is actually a good thing yes but again as Brody said in the video i keep talking about Brody because he makes he's the only one who made the video uh but the uh, the thing with that is it scares people off because when they see orange color with unverified they're gonna go oh maybe i shouldn't touch that maybe i shouldn't approach that question i would like to ask is do users even know what the default position is? The what? If users know what the default position is. Mm. If they don't know, then you need to have something telling you even the default position. That's true. It would be it would also be nice if like uh there was an API to push this stuff down towards like uh GNOME software or KDE Discover. Yeah. Or KDE and Katie, does worry those applications can tell you if it's a verified package or not? Yeah, that that would that be would great. Be nice. Maybe it's down the pike, but here's the thing: uh, if you go on Flat Hub and you look to, for your application, even verif even verified apps, if you scroll down to the description, you're going to see a big orange warning telling you unsafe because yep. it. It needs permissions to your mic. It needs permissions to your camera. Or uh, it needs a legacy windowing system, otherwise known as X11. <laughs> <laughs> and Shots that fired. is where portals will come in one day. Fingers yeah. crossed. But potentially unsafe, they have to label it as something else. Well, because it, is, it is by definition potentially unsafe. Yeah, but... My question should... is... Is why does it? Why are they putting all this effort into the website itself when the number one resource that people are using to is GUI package packs, managers is and the, GUI yeah. package managers do have some of those things, like for example, some. the potentially unsafe no yeah. package manager no discover software center does have that as a and discover and but discover. does it tell you? But does does the GNOME software center tell you why it's unsafe? Yes. Yes. If you so click the, on the if you okay, click on the potentially unsafe, it will yeah. tell you. At least this last time I tried it. And, and on it discover, used to not tell you. I know yeah. that much. Well, <laughs> here's the thing: who's going to click on it? Here's nobody. Another... Nobody will scroll yeah. down. Exactly. So maybe it it is useful to have unsafe, but uh, unverified. But they need to word it differently. <laughs> Uh, maybe put not uh, or just put community maintained, not uh, developer maintained or something. What does that or, mean? Or you know, uh, to a normal like, user. Well, here here's my thing about FlatHub, right? If you look up Spotify on FlatHub, who does it say that's that that uh, Spot Spotify is made by? Spotify. Yeah, that's where the unverified ba badge actually makes yeah. sense. But in my personal opinion, it should not say by Spotify. It should say yeah. by package maintainer name. Yeah. Yeah, but who? How would users know if it's if it is the maintainer? Who is the it maintainer would... of each package? I mean, and that's Spotify didn't make the package. It tells you that right there. Yeah. 
<laughs> For example, I just opened up a package and it does, as I said, it does actually show you what it requires. And while GNOME software does actually say who, who makes it, at least that, it does point bugs directly to the upstream. So that's bad. Well, here's the thing. Uh, there are packages, aka OBS, that doesn't have a flat hub uh, place or location. You, it takes you directly to a flat hub on GitHub. Uh, sorry, uh, OBS yeah. on GitHub. Directly to the developer's uh, GitHub, basically. Yeah. So... Yeah, there are a few packages, and some packages take you to flat hub on GitHub. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, the ones that take you to GitHub, I think, are unverified, and uh, the ones that take you to flat hub on GitHub, but the ones that take you directly upstream are the, the ones that should be verified. But at least they fixed the issue with uh, Steam being verified now it's unverified good because before it was a mess people were going to valve reporting issues with the flat pack when the flat pack was absolutely not where uh, valve was putting its efforts it was putting its efforts in the debian package that's it yeah so. either debian package or whatever it is that they're shipping on steam os mm, yes yeah. uh, <laughs> some the sort flat of pack. custom thing yeah. yeah, they don't actually use Flatpak for Steam. No, it's the wrong. <coughs> if you want, if you want to install Steam as a Flatpak, then you're doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> That's no, that actually, way. you're not. It Come on, I fine. mean. You're adding more barriers on top. On, yeah, that's what I'm saying. On top of your, uh, you're actually experience. not. Uh, but you need uh, but that's a discussion for another episode because yeah. uh, teaching you how how kernel namespaces and all that works is going to take a while. <laughs> it probably will take a while. But anyways, guys, I think that's going to be a wrap for, th for today's episode. If you would yep. like to uh, give a, s send us feedback about our wonderful discussion here, you can always send us an email to contact at tuckspace.com. Uh, th there's also some links in into all of our individual YouTube channels as well as the podcast YouTube channel because I actually remember to do that this time <laughs> uh, in, in the description as well. In the meantime, guys, we're going to be out of here. Bye. Bye. See ya.